Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Today we're going to hear about uh, two two potential therapies, EVs and AAV, and in fact how they can be combined um, to 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 make to make them even more effective. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Sismita Sahu's lab today, uh, from Sabrina Lasalvia and Shi Sheng Li, and I would like to invite uh, Sismita first of all to say a few words about the lab. But let me just remind everyone that you will be um, you'll be on mute right now. But at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to unmute and ask your questions, make your comments. But in the meantime, please put those questions and comments into the chat box, and then we can get to them at the end. Um, so, Smita, thank you so much for joining today and for presenting this very exciting work, which was uh, just recently published. So um, please go ahead. Thank you, Ken, so much for this invitation. And we are so excited to share our recent research with everyone at the EV Club. And we... Um, uh, I would like to introduce Sabrina and Shishong, uh, who are co-first authors of the paper and did the outstanding work, uh, as you would see in a few minutes. This was a very long and difficult project. It took us like more than five years to complete. Uh, and of course, uh, in, the, in between COVID came. So thanks to their resilience, thanks to their hard work. And, uh, you know, I'm so proud that we were able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I, congratulate um, both uh, these outstanding young scientists. And um, uh, the background of this research started when we and uh, we came across a publication uh, that was presented in the ICEP meeting. And I was so excited to see that meeting that EVs uh, can carry AVs like HIV and other viruses. I came running to my lab and I shared this information with my lab and, and then mentor Dr. Rosar Hajar. And we started the very long and difficult journey. As you know, protocols for EVs are so complicated and mix that with uh, you know AVs. So we are merging two very complex field, uh, hopefully in the goal to reach clinics someday. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of clinical perspective before we go, uh, these uh, um, EVAVs are one of the next gen therapeutic entities that are pitched to address the flaws in exist in AV gen therapy field. And without further delay, I would hand over the microphone to uh, first Sabrina and then Shishang from both of whom you'll hear today. Thank you again. Thank you uh, so much, Susmita, for this kind of introduction, and uh, thank you everybody for this uh, great opportunity. And the the title of the talk today is AV Encapsulated AV AVs for Therapeutic Gene Delivery to the Art. Uh, first of all, cardiovascular disease remain a large global health problem. Also, if there are different conventional treatment uh, are viable for common cardiovascular issues, gene therapy is still a potential treatment option. And we have a little history of more than 4,000 clinical trials in the last past decades. Um, in particular, there are different vectors that can be used in cardiovascular application. And uh, in particular, in this paper, we are using adenosicide vector that is a virus of 20 nanometer in size, is a single strain DNA. And in combination with extracellular vesicles, we are able to improve the efficiency of the uh, gene delivery. Uh, AV vectors are well suited for use in the treatment of heart failure because they can transduce non-dividing cells. They are not pathogenic, they are non-mutagenic, and they, they can uh, be produced in higher titer. And uh, they can achieve long-term trans transgene expression in animal models. So for this reason, it, it got a lot of attractions. Uh, the, limit, uh, the presence of uh, neutral, you know, neutralized antibodies really uh, the limit the vector transduction, and this is the, really, uh, re really the, the issue. And uh, to, there are different ways in which we, uh, we, um, people that can face this problem, for example, uh, engineering the vector can increase the transduction. But in our lab, we are, we are encapsulating our virus in, in a double post membrane. And uh, we call that this preparation EVAV. And in this case, uh, the EVAV can uh, shield from the presence of NAB activity. And uh, there is, uh, in, in this way, there is more uh, transduction. There is more delivery in the cardiomyocytes. Um, so um, EVAV are naturally produced by AVV producing cells. And here we are using X cells. 
So after transfection, we collect uh, in the media a mixture of EVAV and free AV. And then we use two-step periodic signal gradient separation um, uh, to uh, purify and reach EVAV from free AV. So first we use a, a ultra centrifugation step in which we can collect our EVAV. In this case, we, we call crude EV. Then we load in a density gradient our preparation. We spin and after uh, the spin, uh, we collect 12 fractions. And uh, of course, by density, the EVAV, they will float more in the early fraction, in this case, fraction three and four, and the three AV, um, the majority of them, they are collecting more in the late, in the late fractions. Then uh, we, um, we want to characterize our fraction three and four uh, with different tools. And first of all, we, we, we use uh, trans transmission electromicroscopy, in which we, as we can see here, we have a nice picture in picture in figure A. We have a nice picture of our virus here in red, where it's surrounded by a double positive membrane. And uh, we compare our EVV prep with uh, EV pre EV and also EV wild type. EV wild type means that are EV that are, are re released from X cells that they were not transfected. So we have a control. Then we focus on the size and uh, the concentration uh, using TRPS um, uh, tools. And then we also uh, phenotype our, our fraction three and four by Western blot. And as we can appreciate here, uh, we have a particle size of uh, around is around 100 nanometer in fraction three and four, and we used uh, the the common EV marker for Western blot uh, like Alex Plutlin and TDS G101 to characterize our EV EV, and we also use negative control. Then we uh, we use also imaging flow cytometry that is a tool for single EVE detection. Of course, uh, we use all the control and the right dilution that uh, is in the supplementary figures. And it's very uh, great tools to characterize the uh, EV markers as well uh, in comparison with the Western blot. We use uh, a cocktail of tetraspanin because uh, our size of our EVV are it's in the small size and uh, the Cocktail of the Tespani are where like uh, CD9, CD63, and CD8. And we were able to, to see that our EVAV, they are uh, labeled with uh, the Tespani, especially in fraction three and four, comparison to the others. Then we focus also on the density and also on the vector genome. And uh, as we can appreciate here, we have uh, uh, fraction three and four, they have the same voice and density of a regular. EVAV that we can find in the, in the literature. And we measure also by vector genome by qPCR. And uh, in this case, uh, we can see that fraction three and the majority of fraction four, they have more than 20% uh, of total genome. Another important step, it was to understand the, uh, to test the viral genome integrity. And uh, to do this, uh, we, we use DNA uh, alkaline agarose gel electrophoresis. Uh, we test two different titers, E11 and E10, and we were comparing EVAV and free AV. As we can see in the, also here among the quantification, we didn't see differences between uh, the DNA quanti quantities between EV and free AV. And this was a very important step because uh, confirmed the accuracy of, vi of our, our vir viral genome uh, for the uh, title, especially for uh, the title with the qPCR. Uh, it's very uh, important step because all day, uh, every time that we have to inject or uh, work on the animal, um, we need to load the equal amount of EVA free AV and we need to measure with qPCR. So we test this part as well. Um, it, it, we integrate in the paper. Um, so the, the following step, it, uh, it was to, uh, to move in vitro uh, our experiments. And what we actually in the paper, we are showing, we used two cell line, existing cell line, and uh, here I'm presenting human IPS derived cardiomyocytes. 
Uh, this is what we did. We used different concentration of NAB from zero milligram milliliter to four milligram milliliter, uh, milligram milliliter. And we treat our cells with AV6 or EVAV expressing M cherry. M cherry is a construct in which when it's integrated, can emit, can express in the red channel. And what we can appreciate here is that more you, there is an increase when there is a more NAB, when the NAB concentration is increased, there is more neutralization of the expression of Encheri, especially when we treat the cells with EVV, just free AV, uh, with, uh, just with free AV. We uh, performed this experiment with, uh, with flow cytometry, also confocal. And here I just reported the quantification of uh, flow cytometry. And uh, we can summarize that EV vectors deliver genes more effectively uh, to cardiomyocytes, while also protecting the AVs from neutralization by anti-capsid antibody. Um, then uh, we move our experiments in vivo. And uh, in this case, we use nude mice with NAB and uh, in presence of NAB without, without in presence of NAB. We perform uh, intramar cardiac injection. So it was a little bit tricky because the mice is very, uh, you know, these injections has to be very precise. Um, and we, um, we, per we perform uh, this intramar cardiac injection with EVV9 or free EV9 expressing luciferous construct. And then we acquire bioluminescent bio images in vivo, and also we harvest the, the heart, the liver, and the brain, and we have some data. Um, so what we can appreciate here in the red box is that in presence of NAB, the majority of the expression of luciferase is neutralized comparison when we use the free EV9 in comparison of EVV9. And here on the bottom, we have the, the quantification, and so we can appreciate, appreciate here in the NAB group, uh, it's significant. And we also uh, did the same, uh, um, uh, the same, uh, we did the same, uh, we did the same with, with the art. And uh, we can also appreciate here that uh, the, uh, the luciferous expression is more when we inject EVV. Uh, comparison to the uh, free AV9, and uh, also if it was not significant. And now I will uh, leave uh, Sishon to talk yeah. about the functional part. So after confirming the EVAV9 vectors evade uh, uh, NAB neutralized antibody in mice, next uh, we study the therapeutic uh, delivery of genes by EVAV. So studies have shown that reduction of sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum calcium ATPase short for circa in falling heart is a key factor in depression of contractions, and that restoration of circa levels can improve the heart function and remodeling. So up to now, there are two clinical trials completed, and. Uh, uh, from clinical, it shows that no significant adverse events when vectors were given to patients at low dose. And one patient who had received the AV circa vectors at high dose had a neutralized antibody response. Besides, the, right now, absolute level of detectable transgene DNA were very low and no functional benefits was observed. So to, to develop a high efficient and safe gene therapy is very necessary. Uh, to advance the gene ser delivery of circa by EVAV, we compare the therapeutic effects on, on cardiac function of circa delivery using EVAV uh, versus free AV in a myocardial infection mouse model. So the mouse were injected with neutralized antibody or saline. After 24 hours, uh, the myocardial infection was induced by permanent uh, ligation of the left uh, coronary artery. And then the mice were intramyocardially injected with the equal titer of EVAV circa or AV circus. And the cardiac ejection fraction and fraction shortening were evaluated by echocardiography every two weeks. And at six weeks, we can see here, in NAB positive mice, the ejection fraction and uh, fraction shortening in the free AV group were significantly lower than the NAB negative mice due to the neutralizing activity of the antibody. However, EVAV9 groups significantly improved the cardiac functions in the presence 
of neutralized antibody compared with the free AV. So for gene therapy of targeting is a big issue. Uh, AV9 has been shown to be cardiotropism in uh, rudent models. So we want to evaluate if EVAV uh, has the cardiotropism. So we intramyocardially inject ecotacker of AV luciferase or EVAV luciferase to the heart. And then we isolate the cardiomyocyte and non-cardiomyocyte from the left ventricle and analyze the transgene expression and vector genomes. In line with our previous data, the bioluminescent imaging showed higher luciferase expression in the heart delivered where EVAV compared to free AVs. By flow cytometry and uh, luciferase assays, we found the luciferase expression and vector genomes in the cardiomyocyte were significantly higher than the non cardiomyocytes uh, Immunofluorescence showed that in left ventricle, the luciferase uh, positive cells were triponentally positive uh, rock shaped uh, cardiomyocytes. However, the luciferase negative cells are largely the non-cardiomyocytes, uh, including the CD31 positive endothelial cells or the limiting positive cardiac fibroblast. So to investigate whether EVAVs also have the cardiotropism in human cardiomyocytes in vitro, uh, we calculate the transgene expression and uptake of EVAV and AV in human a pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and non cardiomyocytes. So, similarly to the in vitro, uh, in vivo result, the luciferase was primarily expressed in triponin positive cardiomyocytes in both AV and uh, EVAV infected cells. And even without a neutralized antibody, the EVAV transduced the uh, cardiomyocytes was with significantly higher efficiency compared to AV. So next, we study the uptake of EVAVs. We labeled the EVAV with the lipid dye PKH67 and treated with the IPS-derived cardiomyocyte and the non-cardiomyocyte in vitro. We also intramyocardial inject to the mouse heart uh, with the PKH-labeled EVAV. So we found that uh, the labeled EVAV were uptaken by both uh, triponin positive uh, cardiomyocytes and uh, triponin negative non cardiomyocytes, both in vivo and in vitro. However, in human uh, pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, the uptaken EVAV were detected around the perinuclear re region, but in IPS, non cardiomyocytes we, uh, they appeared diffused in the cytoplasm. So it suggests a distinct intracellular trafficking between the cardiomyocyte and non cardiomyocyte. So the nuclear entry of the AV is a critical step for successful transgene expression. So to compare the nuclear entry and the gene release of AV particles between the cardiomyocyte and non cardiomyocyte, uh, we infect the cells uh, with eco titers uh, of EVAV, and then we isolate the nuclear after 24 hours, and then we quantify the vector genomes by qPCR. And we found that EVAV delivers a significant high quantity of vector genomes into the nucleus of the IPS cardiomyocyte compared with the non cardiomyocytes. So this suggests a distinction in the Postlysosome nuclear entry between the cardiomyocytes and non cardiomyocytes, which may play a role in the cardiotropic mechanism of EVAV. So, next, we investigate the mechanism of EVAV uh, intracellular trafficking. We incubate the PKH label with the EVAV with A616 cardiomyocyte and uh, IPS cardiomyocyte. And at 10 hours, the confocal microscopy detect the EVAV co-localized with the LAMP1 positive compartments. LAMP1 is a marker of endolysosomes, and they are also acidic compartments. We also stain the EVAV with the anti-AV intact particles at this time point. Interestingly, we observe the PKH EVAV partially co-localized with the uh, AV6 within the cycloplasmic 
at 10 hours. A 3D model co-localization analyzed by Emirates showed that at 10 hours, around 50% of vesicles were still intact and around 50% were separated. So it suggests that EV internalized with the anodizosome undergo the acidification and release the free AV. So to verify this, we label the EVAV with a pKH uh, dye to track the EVAV trafficking in the cytoplasm. cytoplasm. Also, we uh, double label another dye, a uh, cypherous dye. It's a pH sensitive dye that is fluorescent at an acidic pH to track the EVAV trafficking in cytoplasm. So by flow cytometry, uh, we observe the percentage of the pKH and cipher double positive cells maximized at 10 hours. It demonstrated that EVAV sorted into the subcellular uh, compartments with acidic uh, pH. To confirm this, we also pre-treat the AC16 cells with uh, baflumancin. Uh, it is a ataminase inhibitor that can block the acidification of endolysosome compartments then incubate the cells with the pKH and suffer double-labeled EVAVs. After bifidomycin treatment, the majority of uh, pKH EVAV were still internalized, but not in the acidic compartment, only around 10%. Besides, after treatment uh, to block the acidification, the transduction efficiency is significantly reduced. So together, these data suggest that EVAV were internalized uh, into the acidic compartments of endolysosome, where the EVAV might be released and AV may be acidified uh, for further transport uh, into the nuclear. So in summary uh, of this study, we found that free AV can bond with neutralizing antibody that block the AV delivered into the cells. And the EVAV protect the AV from these neutralizing effects to improve the gene delivery to cardiomyocytes. And in the cytoplasm, EVAV were uptaken into acidic subcellular compartments, such as uh, late endosome and lysosome, which may release the AV from EVAV, thereby enabling the uh, nuclear entry and uh, gene expression. So last, I'd like to thank my mentors, Smita Sahu and uh, Roger Haja. Thanks all the collaborators. And uh, thank you everyone's attention. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Sabrina and Shishun. This has been a, a great presentation and really gives us an insight into what we can do by combining AAV and, um, and EVs. So, um, so, so tell tell us a little bit more about your um, about the plans that you have coming up. I mean, what what is it that what do you want to treat with um, with with this method, um, and what are I guess what are what are some of the limitations that you would see, or or are there any? Actually, yeah, right now we are trying the <laughs> to uh, for clinical trials. So yeah, we need uh, like large animals models. Yeah, so right now we are doing some uh, pig experiment based this EVAV. Uh, delivering the circa genes, yeah. Because right now we already finished the uh, mouse experiment, right? So for uh, clinical uh, translation, the large animals uh, experiment is necessary, yeah. We just started to to you to perform this experiment with the EV one type first to study safety. And uh, for our methods, actually, we, we are working on another paper in which we are trying to improve our, you know, uh, tighter using another, we uh, do SEC, especially SEC in this moment, and to improve the tighter. That was the little bit of the limitation when we move to do the first experiments in PIG. Um, this is what I see right now. And of course, we, we are still doing uh, intramyocardial injection as well, but we need to tune many things. So if we use too much parameters, uh, I think right now what we want to do is the safety of EV to understand the titer, which is the expression, to see what is the effect of a CERCA, and then uh, uh, confirm that our method is valid and reproducible, and then uh, we will go from there, I think. 
Very good. I would like all to right. add so, um, a little I would more just, uh, on the limitation oh, go, go because, ahead, you know, yeah. we all know how EVs are limited in their trafficking. When we inject the AVs, we can inject them IV, but EV AVs, if we inject an in IV, um, they go to endothelial cells, other organs, so they are not very effective to reach the heart. And therefore, there are new strategies that has to be devised for cardiomyocyte targeting, heart targeting, and minimizing the availability to other organs, such as liver, because in these kind of therapeutics, liver toxicity is a big problem. So we have to do those preclinical testing and uh, you know move in that direction. And towards that, we also have new collaboration with Evox Therapeutics, who is interested to take uh, this kind of approach to clinic. And of course, they have been working on EVAVs in other avenues for a long time. So we want, would uh, see where this joint force will take us and, you know, uh, what results we will it will yield in future. We're very excited to continue in this line of research. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, now it is time for the audience. Um, you you have the opportunity to interact with our speakers with um, with 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 the lab here, the Sahu Lab. Um, and please just put your put your question in the chat box, and I will get to you in order. And um, when I call on you, be prepared to unmute and to um, to share your video as well if you would like to. So um, let's start now in the chat box with Parda Saradi. Um, could you please go ahead with your question about integrity? Yeah, thank you for that. I would like just like to understand how you measure the integrity of your uh, exosome along with the AAV. What is the method you follow? So that how you estimate exactly this much of virus is loaded inside the exosome, inside the lumen of the exosome. Are you asking? Are you asking if the EV is still intact after the loading, or are you, are you asking what the percentage of of loaded EVs would be? Yes. The what is the percentage of loaded, and how you measure that? Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, so EV concentrations we mm -hmm. can measure by the Q nano. Yeah. And for AVs, the majority uh, by qPCR to detect the uh, vector genomes. So there must have a lot of empty uh, EVs in the preparations. But right now, we're also thinking, how can we remove these empty EVs? Because by aldexanol gradient density centrifuge, we can remove the free AVs. Because the free AV density is higher than, uh, is heavier than the uh, mm -hmm. EV and EVAVs, but for empty EVs, yeah, right now, uh, yeah, we're also thinking of these problems. How can we get more pure uh, EVAV prep? Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question, you know, because I guess it, as long as the empty EVs are not having any deleterious effect, um, perhaps it's not so important that they're there. Um, on the other hand, if you had a more, I guess, homogeneous population, perhaps you could reduce the dose. But um, that that would only be necessary, I suppose, if there were, if there were really any 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 problem with it. Yeah, good. Thank okay, you. next question is from Pam McLean. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, that was a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, so this might be a naive question, but I'm assuming so when you transfect your AV plasmids into HUKs. You're obviously doing. Are you doing the triple transfection method with the the um, the vectors to uh, have the right serotype? So, are the AAV plasmid sizes still restricted as much as like if you can you put a bigger insert in and it'll still you know spit it out in an EV equivalent, or is there no? Do you are you still restricted to the you know the four KB between the ITRs? Uh, thanks for that question. It's an interesting question, and we are yet restricted by that size because we are packaging the uh, what we see in our experiments is we're still packaging the intact AVs 
the whole wholly functional AVs, and that's that's something to look at. If you know these EV AVs uh, have the ability to package more, but at this uh, current moment, the knowledge we have doesn't seem like you know they would exceed that ability because it's just a different packaging mechanism. Yeah. Thank you. So would it would it be an option to to use the packaging mechanism just in an EV, like rather than in packaging into the AAV itself, just using some of its own uh, proteins to do that? Is is that something that anyone has looked at? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we we are here in the same room, so <laughs> you heard some no, echo. No yeah, uh, that that's an interesting question. Like you are asking, what is the need to pack it? Like you know, produce this real AAVs that goes inside the EV instead of packaging the plasmid. Uh, directly to the EVs. Is that your question, Ken? Yeah. So maybe you could just use the same, you know, the same proteins that the virus uh, itself sorry, uses. We don't hear. Um, okay. Um, so, so the, the I, I guess the question is, can you can you engineer an EV to basically act like an AAV without, you know, assembling the assembling the AAV and putting it into the the EV? Yeah, that, that's a very technically complicated question. It's like, you know, <laughs> we use the natural process of the cells to package the EVAVs because, you know, we are just exploiting the natural mechanism that the cells uh, has the ability to secrete these EVAVs to the conditioned media. And therefore, we are just separating the free AVs from the EVAVs and using these as a way to uh, um, to to, ex uh, to address the neutralizing antibody issue. Just uh, you know, like EVs are in a way uh, as a biological wrap to the AVs. Um, so I think your question goes to EV engineering. If, if it is possible not to have AVs and just to have EVs in the plasmid construct, I think the 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 certain groups are trying out that approach, but the challenges are also enormous there. We know the safety and efficacy of the EVs in the clinic, of the AVs in the clinic. And therefore, you know, like AVs have a way to reach the heart and AVs have a way to really stay as an epigome in the nucleus uh, and express for a long term on a long term basis, like in human data uh, shows that AVs can be expressed uh, until like, you know, about 10 years. Um, that is Dr. Catherine High's research. And uh, so they have uh, a lot of benefits. And if we are packaging the normal plasmids in EVs, there would be other issues such as, you know, uh, un non-EV uh, plasmids, toxicity issues. So those kind of studies have to be performed and really, you know, be seen in the context of what is better, EVAVs or just EVs packaging the plasmids. In addition, I would like to also uh, bring your attention the benefit of uh, having AVs in gene therapy because AVs um, are targeted more to the non-dividing cells, such as cardiomyocyte and neurons, so on and so forth. Uh, if you package just the plasmids into the EVs and deliver it, probably the this aspect is going to change because AVs come with you know some of their biological property uh, for which they are they uh, behave in a certain way and can target to the heart and to the cardiomyocytes as well as to the brain, etc. But very good points. EV, yeah, very good um, points. Uh, encapsulated plasmids would behave differently. So the delivery and the targeting would be completely different. And we need to understand, uh, you know, the pros and cons and comparison, direct head on comparison of both of these entities. Does yeah, that the, make sense? That makes a lot of sense. You know, the AAV is, yeah. is a complete therapeutic pa package, right? And Yes, perhaps we could use some of its mechanisms to package more into an EV, but it wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have those have those desired effects. Um, so thanks, Sismita, for cl clarifying that. Um, we next have a question from Elena Martins. Actually, two questions. Yes, uh, thank both. you, Ken. Do, do for the price <laughs> of one. Uh, I think uh, my first question is uh, really exactly follow up on the discussion that we just had. Uh, thank you again for the very nice presentation. So my first question is, uh, do you have any observations of measurements if it is the entire mature uh, AAV that is incorporated uh, into the EVs or is it just the genome with some supporting proteins? Can you hear me? 
We can hear you. I think the, the authors um, are. Yeah. So I would like to take that question as well. So we sequence, uh, you know, our figure two actually showed uh, sequencing uh, data from the EV AVs, wild type EVs, as well as just AVs. AVs, we didn't expect anything. So we believe these, are, and we also conducted proteomic analysis of these samples. And from those observations, we believe it could be um, the fully packaged, full, uh, fully functional AVs. Um, we did some preliminary characterization towards that. Um, and at this point, you know, like to prove that these are AVs, we did some digested digestion experiments uh, just to digest the EVs partially, and then, uh, you know, collect the AVs and all those things. And uh, those data implicate that we actually have fully functional, uh, fully loaded AVs. In addition, we have some empty vectors as well. Uh, like, you know, in normal AV preparation, sometimes you have plasmids which are, uh, you know, partially loaded or completely empty AVs. We see that and our figure two kind of implies that from our Western blot and other data that we have presented. Yes, thank, thank you. you. A very, very, very detailed expression. So um, I may have mixed it, but uh, um, is, is there a chance that um, there is a mix between uh, in in the in that fraction in those fractions three and four between EVs that carry a vector uh, for virus and just viral particles? Like uh, practically, uh, have you done any single single vehicle analysis? <laughs> that is the that is the the bottom question. Uh, th thank you for the question. We we spent a lot of time actually to tune the methods. For this reason, it took a, a while to publish this paper because uh, um, also the density gradient, you know, uh, we, we try a different density gradient actually, but we purify EVV in fraction three and four. Of course, there is a percentage always that can be detected, but it's very, uh, you know, because when we use, for example, we use this fraction, we do like a uh, luciferase assay, you know, we we do like a neutralizing assay, we see that there is a, they are resistant. So this is also, it's our method, especially because at a certain point we start to use SEC. So we were doing, collecting all the fractions. So our method also to increase the title, to increase which kind of fraction we want to use, uh, the best way is to treat the cells and see which one are the resistant or not. In that case, we know more or less uh, what um, the amount of EV that they are in the fraction or not. So. To summarize, uh, in, uh, in this case, fraction three and four, they're super enriched. Also, with TM picture, we saw that are uh, more enriched of EAV and partially with uh, But But there, there's a chance that there's a little bit of uh, free virus in there as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, congratulations. Very nice research. And looking forward to the clinical ap applications in the future. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, next question Vera Silva. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, really nice presentation, guys. I just have a bit, it's probably a naive question, but still, if, if your trophism from the thinking about a free AV, right? If the trophism mediates which cell you're targeting and then you're putting it inside an EV and you've clearly showed that the mechanism of post entry is slightly different, do you think it matters which serotype you're using in that case for your indication or would several different serotypes work for circuit two or other disease indications, for example? Um, actually, you know, for free AV, the stereotype is very, is very crucial. Uh, but what we noticed right now that we are using EVAV, uh, we saw actually that there is a little slightly difference when you, you, you use the stereotype of EVAV 6 and 9 in vitro in vivo. But still, that when they are protected from EV, actually the stereotype doesn't matter. We're still investigating actually uh, a little more the make the truly mechanism in which EVAV are internalized. We are not sure yet. Uh, the, the perfect, you know, from the beginning, but um, we start to do a lot of experiment with the EV update to understand a little more. And we we, we saw, we track some step from um, the entry to, to the nucleus, but we still, you know, <laughs> I have some question when it goes to the nucleus. So maybe in the future we can start to design more experiments, but it's very, it's not very easy. We spend a lot of time. These confocal pictures are from a lot, a lot of, a lot of work. It's just the best that we are showing, but it took a lot of time to, to pictures and create the entire story. Yeah, I, I, 
I would like to add that, you know, what Sabrina said, uh, like you, if your question is, if the EVs are packaging the AVs, how the serotype specificity and uh, all those things are maintained. We think, you know, we have some data in the paper about AVR and uh, some other receptor that are known to uptake AVs. Um, so it's very preliminary and those receptors are not only present on the cell surface, but also present in the intracellular uh, compartments. Um, so we believe the selection of, uh, you know, once the EVs deliver the material in the acidified compartments of a cell, um, they uh, are, they release the AVs. And we have like beautiful confocal pictures where we found out that, you know, only red uh, like um, punctate structures, meaning the AVs are already released from the green level EVs. And we believe there is a selective nuclear mechanism. For example, you know, myocytes are positive uh, for uh, myocytes are uptaking the EV, AVs to the nucleus and non-myocytes are not. So we think there is a nuclear selection as well uh, that plays a role in all these things. So more research is really needed. What kind of receptors are uptaking? What, what is happening? And it's also very possible that some of the AV capsid proteins you know, may uh, secrete uh, on the surface of EVs. We we do not know about that. Um, you know, these are just speculation to a certain extent. And some data we provided in our figure seven of the paper. Um, so we hope to learn more as we go forward in these uh, studies. Yeah, that's really fascinating, Sushmita, like that you could even have some of the viral proteins on the surface of the EVs. That's that's really um, That's really quite an interesting possibility. Um, and and I guess in that in that vein, we now have a question from Navneet Dagra. Navneet, please go ahead. I decided to ask question here, even though Sushmita sits one block away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've seen uh, you know Sishang and Sabrina work day in day out trying to figure out uh, you know separate these EVs and excellent work. Um, congratulations, guys. My my question is, you know, I think maybe Ken can also help with this. This this is actually this goes beyond just gene therapy because up until about fifteen years ago, it was thought that AVs are non-enveloped viruses, and now we are saying there are AVs that are non-enveloped, but there are AVs that are enveloped viruses now, and that that changed the kind of prevailing understanding of what is envelope and what is not, which viruses are. And so that's why I was like, are there other viruses that we up until now thought are non-envelope viruses and now we should rethink? Um, yeah, thank you. How about COVID? <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, my lab is conducting some experiments with uh, COVID viruses, but it's very complicated question uh, is COVID virus size is, you know, kind of similar to EV size, they're bigger viruses. Uh, so we can't distinguish them based on the size. But, you know, when we started this research in Navneet, we had a, like a long conversations about what we should call these EVAVs, are those really enveloped uh, AVs? And we indeed see, you know, there was some ultracentrifugation fraction which were heavier, slightly heavier than EVAVs. And, uh, you know, they look like they are neutralizing antibody resistant and they have the CD proteins on their surface, but they are about the size of like, you know, 30, 40 nanometer as measured by DLS, dynamic light scattering analysis, um, which can measure smaller size particles. And that intrigued us because, uh, you know, are those like single ton AVs, which are wrapped with some membranous material. And, you know, so this led to the conversation and we did not really probe that, but, you know, because that points to the biology of viruses. And, you know, um, I'm very new to the vi virology field, like five years or seven years since we started this project. So Ken, it, it, we would appreciate your thoughts or someone else if, you know, they have more insights on this matter. It would be great uh, to learn. Thank you. Well, I, um, I see that in the chat box, we have a comment from Bethany O'Hara, who points us to a, a recent paper um, on JC polyomavirus um, and 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 EVs, 
And, and certainly our understanding of, of envelope versus non-envelope viruses is affected by, by what we know about EVs. And I think this is a very good point that you've made, Navneet, um, where, you know, there, there are even some viruses that can transmit their, their genomes or par parts of their genomes um, in EVs without, without a viral capsid. Um, and and so so you know what we what we call an enveloped virus, what we call a non-enveloped virus, um, there there may be some nuances to that. And I recall um, I recall also the work from Master Naltatun in the um, very nice paper that she and Leonid Margolis and Rob, uh, Bob Gallo uh, put together in PNAS some time ago, where they referred to a spectrum of, of viral particles. You know everything from that complete virus, you know, I work with HIV, has to have two copies of the genome, has to have all the proteins present, everything has to be there, um, all the way to, you know, a, a purely host EV, you know, even from an infected cell, there's no viral components to it whatsoever. And now I think we can even expand that and say, well, there may even be some um, some some other versions of that of that continuum, depending on which viruses we're talking about. So, so so certainly the the EV it's sort of this nexus of defining what a what a virus is, and 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 the EV even as uh, I I often tell people think about the EV as a kind of virus, right? Because even even in the absence of infection, right. the EV we believe has some characteristics of of of, of viruses. It's able to. Uh, to move between cells, it's able to communicate some some information. Um, so 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 intertwined worlds here, virology and EV studies. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we have. Guys, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks uh, for the comments there. So um, and and Sharif is saying, well, could we could we please just use the word virus and 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 EV and you know I so I, I appreciate that you know we're saying AAEV we're saying EV and we're we're when we use those uh, in the same sentence it can get a little bit confusing certainly <laughs> so thanks for pointing that out. Um, but I it looks like that brings us to the end of uh, the questions that are in the chat box. So just um, if anybody has a last question, please pop it in very quickly. Um, otherwise, um, it's just me to, would you have any, any final comments to make here? Yeah, thank you, Ken, uh, for uh, uh, giving uh, this platform and this exciting discussion with the EV community. I really appreciate that. And I would like to thank, uh, you know, Sabrina and Shishong for spearheading this research. And uh, yeah, with that, um, uh, please uh, look for, uh, we look forward to publishing another paper on the methods, but uh, like how to isolate EV, AVs uh, in a better way than using ultracentrifugation. So um, please look out for our publication, hopefully end of this year or early next year. And with that, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us with this uh, conversation. Feel free to reach out to myself, Sabrina, or Sishong in case you have any other question, any other exciting thoughts, ideas for collaboration, um, and anything else you um, may think that we should consider in this line of research. Thanks again. Very good. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Hope you have a great rest of the week. Take care now. <laughs>